Welcome everyone to the webinar, Ukrainian Displacement in Europe, one year later. Uh, my name is Hanna Behrens. I'm the director at the Migration Policy Institute Europe. Um, and I look forward to today's uh, discussion uh, with our two distinguished uh, panelists who I'll introduce in a moment. But uh, first, uh, a housekeeping note. Um, if you do have access issues, please contact us at events at migrationpolicy.org. Uh, it's important that you note that there will be no voice Q&A, question and answers. So if you do have any questions, please use the Q&A function or chat function. Or you could also email at events at migrationpolicy.org or tweet at migrationpolicy or hashtag MPI discuss. Um, we also would like to flag to you that today we published a related commentary, uh, which you can find on our website called Prolonged Ukrainian Displacement, an uneasy marriage of reception, integration and return policies. But now let's turn to the matter of uh, today. Um, almost one year ago, Russian troops invaded uh, Ukraine and triggering the largest displacement in Europe since World War II. Millions of Ukrainians, mostly women and young people, have since crossed into the EU and have sought a place of refuge amidst the European member states. As we reach this one year landmark, we at MPI Europe invite you as the, as the listener, as the participant in this webinar to reflect on the past year. Uh, Europe, but also other parts uh, across the globe uh, really did rise to the occasion. And we saw and witnessed um, an outpouring of, of solidarity and support with uh, those who had to flee uh, Ukraine. And many citizens also opened up their houses, their hearts um, to those people who had to flee because they were um, touched by the brutal war as it ripped apart lives, but also were shocked at the fact that international aggression and war could still be unleashed on Europe's doorstep. So uh, at a policy level, uh, the activation of the temporary protection directive constituted uh, a milestone or landmark occasion. Why? Well, this policy instrument was devised in the wake of the wars that raged in the Balkans in the 1990s and had not been um, activated in the last uh, 20 years. This instrument, this policy instrument, was devised with um, the idea to deal with a case of mass displacement, especially those which risk to undermine and, and threaten to collapse European asylum systems. So, uh, it's been a really interesting one to see that a policy instrument that maybe was maybe already at the morgue uh, was uh, resurrected and activated uh, in the beginning of March last year. So as part of this webinar, we will also be exploring um, yeah, what it has meant to activate this policy instrument, what it has meant for the 5 million, nearly 5 million Ukrainians or those fleeing Ukraine who have benefited from this, what it has meant for those who support them, whether state or non-state actors. Uh, and for one thing, we, we've noticed, for example, that it did cause a shift, a significant shift in um, the responsibility of actors involved, with notably local authorities often um, being at the front line of the response. But more broadly, what we also want to discuss in this webinar is, of course, the responsibility that has since rested on the shoulders of those responding to the arrivals of, of thousands of refugees fleeing the war in Ukraine. Um, think about state actors, NGOs, international organizations, uh, volunteers, businesses, they have worked day and night to put systems in place to um, register Ukrainians arrival, giving them temporary shelter, making sure their children can access schools and that their parents uh, mostly mothers eventually could find their way to, to the labor market. And, but as the war, war wages on, uh, European policymakers, but also those in, in other parts of the globe, have to face the fact that the likelihood of a prolonged stay um, of at least uh, millions of Ukrainians yeah. will um, be there. And so they also have to deal with this and alongside accommodating potentially new arrivals. So the questions we have, of course, is such a situation, how does this prolonged stay impact uh, public support for the Ukrainian situation? Uh, will narratives shift? But also, what does this prolonged stay mean for integration programs, which maybe originally 
uh, have been geared to a kind of short-term stay and kept an eye on eventual return and reconstruction of Ukraine? And how do we distribute uh, limited public funds across these parallel domains that hosting societies have to work on? Think about reception, integration, uh, return and reintegration, but also the reconstruction of uh, Ukraine. So um, we have published a, a commentary as I, I signaled at the beginning of the webinar to uh, address this kind of uneasy marriage as we call it between those different kind of policy objectives and what it means and how it plays out in the Ukrainian response. But today we're going to have this discussion with uh, two high level experts which bring a lot of experience in also the, the kind of day to day a management and response uh, to uh, the Ukrainian displacement. So we have uh, Ms. Esther Pozovera, who's the head of the asylum unit um, at the Director General for Migration and Home Affairs at the European Commission. And we also have Ms. Pavla Novotna. She's the Director General at the Department of Asylum and Migration Policy at the Ministry of Interior in the Czech Republic. So let me turn first now to uh, Esther. Esther, uh, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, I hope you can hear us okay. Um, one of the big questions we also have, of course, is as I signaled already, this was a new instrument. So yeah, it was also a, a new test of, of really implementing this and implementing it for uh, such a large population. So in, in a first instance, we would like to ask you, um, to reflect back maybe on, on the kind of the, the implementation of it, some of the, the key challenges that you have seen, maybe one of the things we signaled already is maybe the shift to local authorities and what that meant. Uh, and then we can uh, look maybe a bit towards the future, but in a sec, thank you. Well, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me as well, since I was having some problems. Well, and thank you very much for inviting me to, to this webinar. Always very interesting to, to exchange views. It's almost a year because I remember that I also had to intervene in the first webinar you had, in which was a, a bit explaining uh, the council implementing decision. So now we are one year is a good time to take stock also because the, we are going to have temporary protection for yet another year at least. So what I would say is uh, from my perspective, at least uh, the, the most difficult it was uh, really to understand uh, what the temporary protection directive meant because it was adopted in 2001. Nobody has done it in practice. So basically we had to start almost from scratch to try to understand the directive and how to put it in practice. And I think it's to the, um, yeah, to the credit of the directive and the co-legislators at the time that it was actually quite relatively easy to, to implement in the sense that uh, the member states were able to adapt their existing systems uh, to, to be able to implement the directive without having to build something from the very beginning. But if, if I look first uh, from, from the institutional point of view, the first thing we had to do is to create this solidarity platform. We have not done it before. So this was the first innovation we had, how we can create a, a platform, a, a space in which we can exchange information and learn about the implementation of the directive by other member states. We were all learning from each other. We have at the very beginning, the main problem was like everybody was really stuck in, in Poland and the solidarity platform at the very beginning, which included all the member states, the union agencies, international organizations, and given the nature of the conflict, also Ukraine, which was an added value compared to all the crisis. So how we can provide information, these famous information hubs or in the big uh, transportation hubs of the European Union to facilitate the onward movement of people so that these uh, remember at the beginning we're having 200,000 people arriving a day which is which is huge so there was this very beginning of trying to uh, phase the, the 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 number of people coming and how we could do this in a very quick way so obviously uh, the solidarity platform became this area in which uh, the member states could exchange and we could facilitate uh, but it also meant that we need to interpret the legislation. And uh, if you remember, we immediately adopted operational guidelines in trying to harmonize the practices uh, among member states so that we will explain the, the council implementing decision and the temporary protection directive to all member states. We had started adopting frequently asked questions. Uh, then we also had to put in place the 10 point action plan. The commission said, okay, this is what we need to do now in the next 
in the next three to six months uh, to, to make sure that uh, everybody is uh, taken care of and the member states' asylum systems don't collapse and the member states can cope. And um, in this 10 point action plan, one of the main points was actually uh, getting information on where the people were. We didn't have the possibility to take, uh, like in other crises, the fingerprints and put in Eurodax so everybody would know where the people were. There was not that option. And in six weeks, we had to put in place and build from scratch a, a platform to exchange information, the temporary protection platform. Uh, and now to at least know how many people were and where and to avoid that there were abuses into the system. And the other challenge was also to mobilize immediately sufficient operational and financial support. And in this case, I have to say that obviously we, the, the budget of the union was not really ready. The AMIF, the Asylum Migration Fund, were not ready to such a scale. So we quickly had to innovate and try to use all the funds available, the recovery funds, the funds from, uh, from other departments, to try to help member states to, to cope financially with the situation. Uh, because the most important it was to accommodate the people. <laughs> this is the, when you have such a crisis, the, the most important is that people have to move and the people have to receive a place to stay. And here was, I would say, um, so if I would say the three main challenges was uh, coordination, and that was the solidarity platform and information exchange, then uh, information so that we knew where the people were and actually we could target the support as needed and mobilization and operational and financial support. Uh, and here I would say that the main problem is accommodation, how to get everybody registered so that everybody could have access to the rights. So registration and accommodation, I would say, were the two main challenges uh, from an operational perspective, how to get the people registered quickly so they could have access to the rights in a smooth way as is as the uh, temporary protection directive for scenes, because this is supposed to be immediate, because the status is not given by the member states, is the council implementing the decision that says you as a person falling within the scope of this implementing decision, you have this set of rights. It's easy to say, difficult to do. So I would say that the, the, the main challenge was to make those rights a reality, starting with the registration, having everybody process very quickly by getting at least some kind of piece of paper that uh, it was possible to do. And second one, give them a place to stay. And the third one, obviously the other uh, rights, which is more related to employment, uh, access to the labor market, um, and, uh, and then probably school access. But I will discuss that more into, into, the, second, into the second area. So this, I will say, uh, were the main challenges we were faced uh, up front. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, yeah, as you were saying, the the areas in which you yeah also mobilized also online tools to make sure that you could coordinate, uh, that you could change exchange information, make sure that you know where people are, the pressures are, and then make sure that this is a that this yeah like you said this legal instrument could be translated into something that works in practice. Uh, I just before we go and look towards the future, I just wanted to ask uh, one more question. I mean, what we did see was a kind of yeah drastic shift also for those who for newcomers because of the temporary protection statuses from from traditionally maybe asylum authorities dealing with those who arrive to to local authorities uh, in terms of accessing schools and, and registering and, and and you know also accessing housing do you have some lessons learned there in terms of what that has meant and also for future uh, uses of the, the tool so what i think is that um it depends very much on the member states. It's true, the member states try to make use of what they wanted. The main objective of the temporary protection directive is avoid that the asylum systems um, basically collapse. So no, but it's a very, um, it's a system that basically reduces the formalities to the minimum uh, because you don't have to do a, a, a cumbersome application, assessment, decision. It's just based on a registration an eligibility check and that's it. And um, it will look at the administrations of our member states and each member state is very different. Obviously, they pass this into the legal migration systems that they have, which in many cases was the municipalities, but not all member states did so. Um, and it's always, it also means that it's a more decentralized system, I would say, compared to the asylum systems, which are much more centralized because everything in most cases was passed on to municipal authorities it meant as well that uh, there were 
more able to cope with the, with the challenge because it's not the same to, to have a small office or a medium size or big office dealing with asylum applications than to have the huge, then in most member states, there's a big regional and um, administrative authorities that can actually register and process the, the checks. So I think for me, it's not so much about passing on to the local authorities. Uh, what I think is, is the lesson learned is more than when you have a situation of crisis, you really have to probably look into the, what is the burden? What is the formalities you have to do to be able to keep the security because security remains a key aspect, but also make sure that the member states can cope while the people have um, some basic rights in which um, they don't have to go and burden the, the state at the same time. And I think one of the main elements was access to the labor market, for example, so that they don't depend so much. But I would say, and sorry to extend a bit on this, that what it was really unprecedented or it, it went to the next level is civil society. The fact that the majority, if you look around, the, the people open their houses. So obviously that doesn't exclude or preclude the responsibility of the state to provide this accommodation. But we cannot uh, simply, we have to learn from this experience of how important it was to have this public-private partnership between the private individuals that were opening the houses, the state that was there in case there was no possibility of the people that didn't manage to, to get access to the, uh, the private housing, the involvement of the local authorities, of the regional authorities, so I think in a large scale crisis, like the one we just um, lived, we just have to, to learn from these experiences and how important it is to work all together. Yeah, really interesting. And, and, and I'm sure we'll pick up with that with, with Pavla as well in terms of the Czech response, because that was also really important uh, there. Um, and But yeah, I think you already touched upon it while you were saying that one of the, of course, the, the great benefits or strengths of, of the TPD was to, avoid the situation where millions would have to be lodged through uh, asylum claims and would result in long waiting times and, and the like and, and as you say uh, a prolonged or delayed access to all kinds of rights but as we look at the future um, what do you foresee in terms of some of the the next challenges for for the TPD in terms of the renewal of the protection uh, status um, or also potential other links with with asylum system the traditional or the standard asylum system so what I would say, um, as I see it, the first immediate challenge is to renew the, the permits, the residence permits, the cars of the people. We have renewed for another year. We had recommended member states to issue residence permits for two years, but the vast majority only did it for one. So now they have to uh, go back into the administrative machinery of, of getting these permits uh, forward. The second challenge I would say is inclusion uh, I will call it inclusion and not so much integration. I will call it more into the inclusion because I think integration, uh, we will have to see how long this, this conflict is. But I think there is a now an inclusion element, which, in, uh, which for me is uh, three aspects. One is schooling. We know that there are, the children are in school, but still many children are following online uh, the courses in Ukraine. There are several reasons for that. I think what is important maybe for all of us is to reflect that a, a parent doesn't feel that he has to choose between putting the person, putting my kids in a school in, in Belgium, because I'm here in Belgium, or um, following the Ukraine curricula. But there is a possibility that there is not a feeling that I have to choose, but actually that this is something that it can be done with no problem. And then also uh, the long-term accommodation versus the short-term accommodation. There is a certain fatigue also in the private accommodation. One thing is to think that you're going to have somebody in your house for three months. Another thing is to think that maybe it could be for three years. It's, it's not the same. So this transition from um, the private housing or public housing that it was more in a short-term basis into long-term accommodation for me is the second challenge. And the third one, is to prepare for an exit strategy. And, and this exit strategy, obviously, um, we will have to see how the, uh, the conflict uh, continues. But at one point, uh, we will have to see, because it could be that the situation is uh, fantastic and the people can go back to Ukraine, but then we'll have to make sure that we have programs in place that we facilitate that return. 
or it could be that actually the situation is not improving and then we will have to look into the transition from temporary protection status to other ways of, um, of legal status. And this is something that we'll be using now because obviously access to the labor market will be one of the exit elements that we have to take into account. And for that, we need much more language training and recognition of diplomas. Some member states are already promoting this transition from temporary protection to legal migration and residence permits based on work permits or students visas. So this for me is the third challenge, whatever that challenge is, be it that uh, these exit strategies to go back to uh, home or stay longer in the European Union, what we will need is strong European coordination so that there is a more or less harmonized approach to this. Thank you very much, really interesting. Uh, yeah, what is, what is uh, yeah, awaiting us in the next couple of months and, and yeah, how to deal with that. I think that's really interesting. Uh, maybe a final question before then we, we turn to Pavla is, uh, we wanted to also ask uh, about the future of, of the Temporary Protection Directive, as I alluded already to in, in, the, in the introduction, it was to be replaced by a different kind of instrument uh, as put forward in the pact. Um, there are discussions. We've seen now also the value that it can play in a, in, a, in a protection regime. We know that there's also discussions about this in other parts of the globe as to the value uh, and the place of, of uh, temporary protection statuses. Um, so I'd be interested also to be briefly hear your thoughts about that, if you can uh, share some ideas. So for the future, what I would say indeed that we have to learn the lessons from the TPD. We, we, on the one hand, we have to be clear that uh, the crisis we have faced was very specific as well. And we, don't, we cannot imagine that all crises will be like this one. Um, so, but I think that are, regardless of, um, I hope we will not have to activate again TPD. We will see what, what happens in the future. But uh, what I think is that we have to learn from uh, the experience, this collective experience that we've had and uh, to be more prepared in the future for, for any crisis. And this has to be factored into the pact negotiations. We have a crisis proposal now on the table. Um, in this crisis proposal, we had proposed to repeal the TPD. Is it the right decision? This is a bit as well for, for the co-legislators to see. Um, what I think, if I if I may summarize a bit, what I uh, what I think in any case we have to bring into into the from my perspective into the future discussion or whatever instrument we have uh, for for crisis, is how important it is um, to have an, a flexible system, an adaptable system, and uh, how important solidarity is as well, and to have a strong coordination role of of the Commission. One of the things that we saw that made temporary protection is success was that member states basically waived Article 11 of the Temporary Protection Directive, which established some kind of, um, of doubling-like uh, procedure. And that allowed the people to, to move uh, uh, throughout, um, throughout Europe and, and to choose the country. Obviously, this is something that might not be possible for, for all the instruments, but what we need to learn at least is how this flexibility, this fluidity, was very important to, to absorb so many people. Um, and then the role that the Solidarity Platform played in, in precisely in exchanging this information, in coordinating the response, in bringing together everybody. So um, I would say this, this aspect as well is very important. And, uh, and this will have to, we will all have to reflect. Um, on the 8th of March, we will be adopting a communication about one year of implementing the Temporary Protection Directive. This is where we will try to, to draw some lessons uh, from, from the experience. And uh, what I think also was, um, can we say that the Temporary Protection Directive was, is, is fit for purpose? Uh, so this is one of the questions we will try to, to address through our communication. And if there are any kind of lessons that can be drawn for the, for the pact negotiations, but at least I think this strong European coordination, this spirit of solidarity is something that whatever the scale of the crisis we will have to, and whatever instrument we use, we have to take into account. 
Thank you very much. I mean, I think your your argument in in yeah pointing out the need for flexibility and adaptability uh, resonates, I think, well with some of the, the the thinking that has emerged over the past year. The idea that no crisis will be the same; the next one will be different in a different way, um, and that it's really important more to have the kinds of right ingredients there. Uh, and a set of tools that can be applied. And, and I think you were also referring that already uh, with, with the coordination part, the solidarity, making sure different um, actors can be involved, as you said, so really interesting. But let me now uh, turn to Pavla Novotna, as I said, uh, working at the, the Czech uh, Ministry of Interior. Pavla, we, we are delighted also to have you here. Um, well, an important reason is also, of course, that the Czech Republic is now within Europe, uh, the country with the highest number of, of beneficiaries of, of protection um, in uh, per capita. Uh, you've had to yeah, quickly accommodate for a very large population suddenly amidst your uh, local communities, your um, yeah. Uh, your citizens and so we'd be really interested to get a sense maybe before we also look at the future and what awaits also for your government uh, your local authorities but also as Esther was saying pointing out the many kind of I know uh, we've talked before many volunteers NGOs that also really pulled their weight in in dealing with this response so I wanted to get a sense what are the the challenges of of late that you're facing uh, thank you, Hannah, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, well, uh, when it comes to the challenges, uh, as Esther said, uh, since the beginning, I mean, we've, we have been preparing uh, for that for some weeks before the attack, but I have to admit, uh, very frankly, that uh, we didn't expect uh, uh, how quick that would be and how big the volume would be. That uh, was for sure not expected, uh, so we had to uh, keep with the challenges. Uh, the registration challenge was at uh, the beginning the biggest one, but uh, I am glad that we decided uh, to, the pro to do a proper but very immediate registration, which uh, means that it was really uh, uh, done uh, immediate, uh, and we decided to put all the people to the state registry, which was a very important decision, because that means that everybody, the whole government and the whole administration knew who came. Uh, uh, and uh, it was available to all the administrative, uh, to, to all the offices uh, in the administration. Uh, very important to keep them with other uh, issues that came after that. Uh, uh, housing, uh, the first housing question was really uh, a very important challenge. And I'm glad that, uh, as Esther said, there was a huge wave of solidarity in, in the Czech Republic of the, of the Czech nationals. So we basically had three types uh, of, of opportunities, uh, a very large Ukrainian community that was able to accommodate a lot of the uh, of the people who came. We had a lot of solidarity housing, uh, but we had established a state guaranteed uh, housing system. Now, now we are in a situation where we have uh, from the people who use the opportunity of housing of the Czech Republic, in the Czech Republic, which are which is a quarter uh, of all the all the refugees. Seventy percent use the uh, state uh, guaranteed uh, housing. Thirty percent use the solidarity housing of the of the Czech families. Uh, so far, uh, a big challenge were the schools, uh, and I have to admit that really it was uh, uh, everybody was very worried whether we are able to cope with that. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it became not such a big problem as expected. Uh, so we were able to accommodate the people and the, the, the pupils in the, in the school. Uh, uh, so very good. Uh, again, a challenge, the healthcare system as well, expected to be a much bigger problem than at the end it was. We decided to give everybody the same rights as the Czech citizens have uh, uh, from, from the day one. Uh, which, uh, well, uh, nobody knew how, how the capacities would uh, cope with that, uh, but uh, we were able to somehow establish the system, uh, system for that. Even the security questions uh, uh, that were raised uh, uh, are not such a big challenge as expected, uh, but this uh, still seems, will, will be seen in, in the future, I guess. But when it comes to the challenges we have now, uh, I would say, and it was said here, it's the question of public perception. Uh, and uh, there is a kind of, and it was said here already, a kind of fatigue, of course. Uh, that's natural. It's uh, really, really, uh, we could have, we can expect that. Uh, 
But I have to say that we don't have a huge uh, perception that we should not help uh, Ukrainians. Uh, so that's not the, 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 the case. Uh, it's rather the case how uh, and how far we should go. Uh, and uh, of course, it was as well said here, uh, the limited public resources, the limited public funds. And we need to uh, keep uh, an eye more on that, how we relate that we can explain uh, very well to the public what we used for the funds. Uh, for which, uh, for, for, for what situations we, we use the funds. That's, that's a, a real a challenge. Thank you very much, uh, Pavla. And I think it's really interesting the overview that you gave um, the, in terms of the different kinds of, uh, yeah, the kind of first response, the emergency response that was required, especially in those first months. And then Esther also referred to, um, and also maybe picking up on, on that last point where you're talking about public funds and how that also may relate to, to the public perception. Uh, and it goes back to also what we we're saying at the beginning and with Esther as well, this kind of what does it mean to have this kind of perspective of a prolonged stay? Um, what does it mean in terms of the kinds of challenges that, that lie ahead? One of the things that we also outline in, in the commentary we published today is this kind of, yes, this kind of kind of three parallel domains that um, countries are now expected to work on. So especially before Christmas, there was this concern that the numbers would rise because there were attacks on the energy infrastructure of Ukraine. So at any moment in time, you still have to be ready to accommodate newcomers and, and do the exercise what you've done with them in the past. At the same time, I mean, uh, Esther was referring to this word inclusion, but it's also about how we make sure if people stay for a prolonged way, what does it mean um, for host communities, for those who um, are already there? Because on the one hand, if we maintain that perspective also on uh, and respect also sometimes the, the choice of, of Ukrainian uh, yeah, parents to have their children still continue, for example, Ukrainian education system, we see that in Poland. Uh, at the time in September, when there were 450,000 children that could potentially be integrated, the question is, can we continue this online education? Do we integrate them in the Polish education system, which in turn allows for uh, stimulating the language, stimulating friendships, uh, that kind of social bonds, which we know are so important. Um, but at the same time, we know, of course, there's a lot of pressure on education system across uh, Europe as well, shortages of teachers and the like. And the same on the labor market. We know that in the first instance, the idea was to facilitate access. And as Esther pointed out, the Temporary Protection Directive enabled that. And that was one of the beautiful elements or dimensions of the of the directive and, and the it being applied, but at the same time, we know from the data that, that has been gathered also by the OECD is that you know the type of job was of a secondary importance. Um, and now we have the addition that comes to the third point, the reconstruction of, of Ukraine. We know that the Ukrainian government has reached out to so many different member states to really also make sure that they can mobilize all the resources that they have available to, to to reconstruct this country and, and of course their citizens and the contribution that they can make is such an important one. And maybe you can also give some examples there as to any kind of uh, outreach from the Ukrainian government on that front as well, because there's this tension between integration and also making sure that they, we do not cause a brain drain in, uh, in process. So looking forward to hearing a bit more from you on, on those kind of challenges. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. I, I will start with uh, the, the debate you, you, you said on the escalation uh, uh, scenario. We had that very, uh, I mean, in every European country, we had the debate in, 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 mainly in, uh, in December. Uh, and we made a decision uh, here uh, that we will go two strains. Uh, we will prepare for the escalation scenario separately from the debates on uh, the standard, I would say, uh, TPD uh, situation. Uh, uh, so it, it went uh, two strains uh, and the escalation went in a like, well, pre uh, I would say preparation, uh, just preparation system. Uh, uh, on the uh, standard, if I say uh, temporary protection, we have to deal with two strains as well. Uh, we have new arrivals uh, and still, I mean, the, the, the numbers are... Uh, Kind of steady since June 2022, uh, but they are still very, very high, much higher than ever expected. Uh, so we have still new arrivals, and we have core people are almost a year uh, on the territory, and uh, uh, we 
well, use the word adaptation and integration. Uh, so uh, kind of use the word as adaptation uh, for the first months uh, and, uh, uh, and then the integration for, uh, I would say, a period that would uh, go beyond that. Uh, uh, what is the, the, the difference uh, and what we uh, decided to do is that for the first first months we go uh, with a, I would say, more flat system. Uh, so basically whoever comes, uh, uh, they get into a flat system of support, uh, state guaranteed housing, uh, um, uh, healthcare insurance, uh, uh, social security, all that. Uh, there is an adaptation process, I would call that, uh, that enables the people to somehow find out uh, what's going on. Uh, for example, in schools, we did a 90 days period uh, where the people, uh, where the uh, kids don't have to uh, enter obligatory schooling system because otherwise they would need to go uh, straight into the obligatory schooling system. But after these 90 days, we are, uh, I mean, we strongly uh, want the people, the, the children to go into the obligatory uh, schooling system. That was decided that it was a decision at the beginning. We had a debate with the Ukrainian uh, colleagues, but what we did uh, that we are trying to uh, have uh, close contacts with the Ukrainian education ministry. So uh, that the kids that go to school in the Czech Republic, when they go back then to Ukraine, it's counted into the Ukrainian system, which is, uh, I think, a very good uh, example of how, on how to merge uh, the return question and the integration question uh, uh, all together. Uh, then we, of course, uh, after this adaptation, well, uh, period, I would say, uh, then there is already uh, some uh, level of integration expected, uh, and uh, we are a little bit more uh, encouraging uh, uh, the people to uh, the Ukrainians to go into the system, labor market, and, and all of that. Uh, uh, and it gets as well a more individual approach. That's a big debate here uh, that, of course, uh, I mean, you can't go for forever with a flat system. Uh, you have to start somehow at some point. And it's as well, as we said, public perception that uh, wants that as well, uh, that we go and individually uh, assess uh, the situation where the help is needed, where the help is uh, uh, not, not needed. Uh, so this is, um, uh, this is now the main topic and main challenge we are now actually, uh, actually doing. Uh, when it comes to the labor market, I can echo what you said uh, on the low-skilled jobs. And uh, the, uh, even when we have the debates with the Ukrainians and the questioners and, and all of that, it's not only uh, about the fact that we would uh, not wish them to go into uh, more, more skilled positions, but they themselves do not wish so, uh, because they have to uh, keep some flexibility uh, as well when it comes to the returns. Still, after one year uh, from the questionnaires, we have uh, two thirds of the, of the Ukrainian population wishes to go back. Uh, of course, we know that, uh, that uh, one year is uh, not enough if we are having the same debate in one year. Uh, so two years from uh, from the attack, it will be different. But uh, uh, that's uh, one last thing uh, I would say on the return. We, we have to face the fact that uh, we can't use the standard return system. I mean, and 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 it's completely uh, clear uh, that we can't use them. I mean, the situation in Ukraine doesn't allow to use the the standard return system. So we are a little bit more uh, more hesitant on that, but we are, on the other hand, starting uh, a lot of debates on the reconstruction of Ukraine here uh, and trying to merge uh, the debates on the reconstruction with the debates on uh, on a possible possible future uh, um, return system. So. Uh, so far, we are not active in this area uh, as, as well because the Czech Republic is quite close to Ukraine. And if the people wish to go back and they are doing that, we have a lot of people who are pendling between Ukraine and, and the Czech Republic uh, or going back for, for holidays or for weekends. Uh, so uh, it's maybe a different issue rather than if you would do that from Spain. Uh, but uh, uh, so far, we are not active on, on, on that part in the sense of having a return programs or, or some assistance with, uh, with return programs. Thank you, Prava, really interesting overview. Uh, yeah, and also interesting to hear um, how your, yeah, also interaction with the Ukrainian government or the, the, the responsible competent uh, uh, ministries to discuss, as you were saying, also how to make sure that them accessing uh, the obligatory school within the Czech Republic enables them to ultimately also bring those kind of, um, yeah, yeah, 
qualifications or, or the time they have spent there uh, and actually make sure that it's translatable into something in in uh, of the matrix and, and the curricula back in, in Ukraine. I think that's a really interesting one. Also your points about the tailor-made um, yeah, approaches now when it comes to integration. How do you move from the coin before and the flex approach, as you said at the beginning, to something that's really tailored to some of the individual needs? And then your, I think your final point also about um, the standard return and reintegration system maybe not being the most suited or maybe yeah offering a starting point for reflection on return and that's also something that that Esther was referring to in, in in terms of the exit strategy and I think your point about yeah that the fact that there was a free that there is a free free regime and that there is already this kind of long-standing also um labor migration from this population makes it an interesting one to rethink how we will apply some of the knowledge that we've gained over time on return and reintegration and do this with um the Ukrainian population, but I, yeah, as you both said the, the the very fact that there is this ongoing discussion with the Ukrainian government is a really interesting uh, starting place. So, uh, but before we go to the Q and A, I just wanted to ask maybe some a very brief question: is is what kind of support do you potentially need going forward in yeah dealing with this kind of different. Uh, potential scenarios that may fall in, in the next coming months, um, which may have very different implications depending on if many, many more come or if the, the stay is prolonged or if there's suddenly an exit strategy possible. Yeah, well, being uh, from a uh, ministry, uh, of course, what we need are capacities and capacities mean, uh, I mean, of course, financing. Uh, so it's it's really uh, one of the of the key issues, because, again, uh, there are only limited, uh, limited funds available. We have to as well take into account that we have large uh, Czech population that it needs a lot of support as well as the energy crisis. Now, uh, it's a very uh, important uh, point as well that needs to be taken into account uh, so uh, so that that's what we really now are uh, looking into how are we able to the most efficient way of using the capacities and the finances uh, because uh, and even with the financing uh, if, we, we, if we have one uh, or more uh, then again, we need to have capacities uh, to use the financing. So it's 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 really the biggest challenge, and uh, what we are going to do in the next months and uh, I think even years, uh, we will have to cope with the, with this issue. Uh, and it's it's a, of course uh, a very delicate debate. Sure. Thank you very much, Pavla. Um, I will now uh, go into uh, Q and A. As we mentioned at the start, uh, do use the Q and A or chat function if you want to raise questions or email. We've already received several of them. Thank you very much for those. Um, let me first turn to uh, Esther. Esther, there's a couple of questions uh, about the current. Um, I mean, maybe first of all, uh, yeah, also in terms of the numbers, our understanding is that the numbers about nearly 5 million are the ones that are uh, referred to the number of people that actually registered. We know there's maybe potentially some double counting and that some people are not registered. So maybe if you can give us some more information um, on that. And then uh, there's also a question about, yeah, the fact that for the moment, uh, TPD is, is supposed to, yeah, pause or, or at least avoid or, or circumvent the whole uh, idea of all these Ukrainians having to go through a standard asylum procedure. But what, what if, if it would be prolonged? Is there already some kind of advanced thinking um, going on uh, between the member states or at EU level as to what it would mean if, if, uh, if they would stay uh, longer? And then there's a couple of questions, but I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Thank you. So. <clears throat> When it comes to the numbers, uh, what's in a number? Um, there have been uh, lots of numbers going around. Um, I, I will double check, but to my understanding, it's, it's more closer to, it's more about 4 million, not 5, uh, but I'm double checking. Um, that's why what was one of the reasons to have the, uh, the temporary protection platform, at least to get a bit of information, just to say that, um, and this is going to be extremely technical, but the, the commission um, is not the owner of this data. So the member states are the ones that are exchanging information and the commission, the only thing that it, we do is basically to share this, uh, this information about, um, um, allow the member states to exchange data among themselves. But it's also, 
it's complicated and because of this, uh, if you look at the general approach that the Council adopted on Eurodac in June uh, 2022, during the French presidency, one of the amendment, amendments they introduced in the general approach, it was precisely to connect temporary protection with Eurodac because uh, the temporary protection directive was done in 2001. There was nothing such as uh, fingerprinties, IT systems, and nothing like this. And, uh, and now what the, uh, the council did was to try to bring it to the 21st century, making use of, of the tools that we already have available. So I think this is one of the innovations that might happen during the, the, uh, the discussions between the member states. But it's, I would say that um, it's not the 7 million you've heard, uh, it's not the, um, also for you to know what we discovered is that there was a, a lot of Dublin counting inside the member states. Uh, because sometimes, particularly, you have a system that is very decentralized. People were moving from one region to another, and then the persons we registered twice. So this is something I think we, through the temporary protection platform, we helped um, the, the, the people to, um, uh, to solve the, the problem. And what was the second question, um, Hannah? The second question is, yeah, in terms of the future, I mean, the fact that, uh, yeah, the administrative pause, uh, what do we envisage? Um, because, yeah, the, the, of course, if you just think logically, then the idea would be that all of these uh, asylum claims would be uh, submitted just a few years later. But of course, there's yeah. that. Well, we're interested to hear any thinking on that. So, yes, there is. Um, we are starting to discuss with the member states and the possible scenarios uh, because there is um, the, the good, the, the, the most optimistic scenario, the less optimistic scenario. The most optimistic is that the world will be concluded soon and, uh, and then the people will be able to go back home. And as, um, as Paula said, that we know that many want to go back home to help in the reconstruction. And the other discussion is where, what if it goes, uh, we need to prolong it for another year or even go beyond 2025 because the situation has not improved. So there is discussion uh, among uh, the member states and among the commission, but I think it's, um, in our view, it's a bit too early. As I said, what we need to be prepared is for exit strategies. And what we will need is a European coordinated approach because it doesn't help if one member state adopt, adopt one position and the other adopts an, a different position. I think we will have to um, wait a bit and see what are the, the conditions in Ukraine. What I think is whatever the scenario, we will need this European approach, coordinated approach, and we should be now ensuring that there is more um, access to, uh, to the labor market so that there is access to the language skills uh, that the people invest in language skills and recognition of diplomas, because in any case, it's going to be um, to be useful. And as I mentioned, uh, there are already some member states that are trying to put in place some mechanisms to ensure a smooth transition towards other statuses, other forms of um, of, of migration migration permits in the countries, uh, because it's not possible just to say we put on hold four million and asylum applications and then we have to deal with all of them at the same time. Then we will be defeating the purpose of the exercise. So whatever happens, I think we will have now one two years, depending on how the situation is, to ensure um, a more coordinated approach to a possible exit strategy whatever that is, being to go back uh, home, being to stay here for a longer period of time, but without um, having a negative impact on the asylum systems of the member states or on uh, undesirable effects uh, because of different approaches adopted by the different member states. Thank you, Esther. And maybe one more question before then I turn to Pavla as well with some of the questions from the Q&A. But um, there are uh, questions about, you know, taking some of the, the lessons you had pointed out, Esther, in, in implementing the TPD forward. So uh, one of the things that you had also referred to was this huge solidarity and the involvement of citizens as well. And so there's one of the questions that ask, I mean, is this kind of, it's called, well, the, the, the person in chat referred to citizen housing, but the idea that citizens play a role in uh, generating accommodation or temporary accommodation, is that something to take forward and, and how can we envisage that? That's one uh, question. Another question talks about, yeah, some of the other points that you had also pointed out in your in your entry, uh, introductionary uh, comments was about this kind of coordination and the solidarity platform. What have we learned? Have there been, um, yeah, maybe potential setbacks and how have they been addressed? Uh, and 
can we, uh, yeah, is this really working for also the member state, this kind of coordination? Is there any improvement going on for the moment? Mm -hmm. So on the involvement of the citizens, I would say that we already a bit taken that into account uh, in, the, in the sense that we have provided much more in the pact in the resettlement regulation about humanitarian corridors, this idea of sponsorship that the individuals will be a bit more engaged. And I think through the TPP, what we have learned and it is indeed that we will see more and more of the citizens that are engaged, but again, it's, crisis is different. So also it's difficult to, to predict what will happen in the future. But indeed, this is one of the elements um, that we can probably better reflect also in, in the way we, we prepare our programs. I don't know to what extent this will have a reflection in legislation. We already have the, uh, uh, the humanitarian corridors and some initiatives that we already funded in the past in regard to, um, to private sponsorships. So we will have to see a bit how this, if, if, if this is reflected legally in, in the future. And uh, in terms of the coordination and the solidity platform, yes, I think, I think it, in terms of um, being, uh, helping member states to earn trust, this is important. And I, will, I was going to explain now a bit, when we have the relocation the decisions back in 2015, 2016, we had this type of platforms, but it was more in the member states. So we have one platform in Greece, one platform in Italy. What really worked well this time is that we have one platform that applied to everybody. So everybody was, all the member states were able to exchange information, all member states were able to complain if they needed to complain. There were the agencies uh, involved. There were also international organizations. We had a specific, um, subgroup of the platform also with uh, international partners like the US, Canada and the UK. So I would say this comprehensive approach helped also to build trust among the member states. And this, I think, is probably the best aspect of the Solidarity Platform, that it really became this place, the place to go, the place to be, the place to discuss and uh, with different ramifications because we have different groups. What I think it worked less well is that uh, we didn't prevent imbalances among member states. If you look at the map of where the people are, we cannot say that all, uh, display, all people displaced from Ukraine are all uh, are spread equally, evenly among member states. What we see is still there are a lot of imbalances with a few member states with a huge burden also because it's, they are very close to Ukraine. So it's easier uh, to go back home to visit as, as Pavla was saying, just to go on holidays to check on your house is still there or not. Uh, so this has not, the Solidarity Platform didn't completely help to, to reduce these imbalances. And we should not forget as well that we didn't have, uh, the Solidarity Platform was this very informal network that was created, and you can see it's in a recital of the council implementing decisions. So something a bit more robust would probably have um, helped the platform to better fulfill its tasks. Thank you for those reflections, really interesting. And maybe I can just put the, the question also to, to Pavla. Pavla, you as, you know, uh, having to, yeah, being one of those people, one of these governments that have to uh, be able to make the maximum use of, of the solidarity platform and really you know, see it as a kind of vehicle or resource for, for addressing the kind of really big challenges that you mentioned to us before. Uh, we'd be also interested to hear your views as to how it's been working so far um, and to what extent it's also a possibility for you to convey uh, some of the pressure that experience in them because there's some questions also in the chat about the pressures on housing and accommodation. I mean, are there possibilities also to convey um, these concerns and also, yeah, uh, with the right um, interlocutors on the other side? Yeah. Well, first uh, on the on the solidarity platform, we are using it very much, uh, and we are glad it was established. As uh, we are very much supporting that, uh, and I have to say that we don't mind so much that it's so informal because somehow uh, even the TPD, uh, because it was uh, an old instrument, it somehow uh, gave us more flexibility than uh, a new one would give us. Uh, so I'm not uh, so much against that because it was very much discussed here: flexibility adaptability the every crisis is different uh, so I would really I'm, I'm more uh, saying that uh, coordination is 
needed. I agree with Esther on that. Uh, coordination on the exit strategy is one of the issue. We are uh, as well one of the countries that is uh, really uh, supporting that and asking for that because uh, we, that, that, that would bring us very undesired uh, uh, situations if we don't have that. So uh, very much welcomed, very much needed. Uh, but we value as well, uh, to a certain point, the informality and uh, the flexibility that uh, we have uh, as, as uh, member states through that. Um, uh, so this is one thing. On, on the capacities, and we had a lot of debates as well, is the commission uh, and uh, on, on the questions of imbalances, uh, maybe. Uh, we, are no, we never asked for... Uh, well, any um, any support when it comes to that the people should be sent from the Czech Republic somewhere else because we understand that they decided to go for the Czech Republic for some reasons and uh, we don't mind that. Uh, but of course, uh, we will always be echoing the need for uh, some uh, balance in, in financing. That's, uh, and as Esther knows that, uh, we are speaking about that. Uh, so, because we need to uh, work on the capacities and it is, it's questions in the, in the uh, Q and A or uh, what, what, what are the needs uh, in capacity building and local administration. And, and there are huge needs. Uh, there are for sure huge needs uh, uh, on the schooling system because we were able to, uh, uh, to manage that because we changed the rule for the schooling system. So we can have more children in one class, for example. That's nothing we would like to have, but uh, we were we needed to do that because uh, to, uh, because we needed to manage. Uh, but of course, it means we will need more infrastructure in the schooling system in the months and years to come. Uh, mainly in a scenario where the people would stay on the territory. Housing. Uh, we are starting very nice programs with uh, IOM and with with other organizations on housing. Pro uh, housing possibilities, uh, standard housing possibilities. Uh, again, in infrastructural thing, you can't do it in one month. Uh, it will take more months. Uh, there was a question whether how we can use it for other uh, situations. I would rather say what we are trying to uh, say and, and do as well uh, is how can we use it as well for the citizens? Uh, so whatever programs we do, uh, we are trying to uh, explain that it's a, like, for, this, for example, the social housing program we are now starting. Uh, it's not a social housing program for Ukrainians. It's, a, it's actually a social housing program as such that might be used as well for Czech citizens, because of course you, have, you still have a lot of citizens who have as well housing problems. problems. So this is very important for public perception. We should not look on, on it only. We are now uh, taking care of the Ukrainians. We are taking care of the whole system in which we now have uh, more 4% uh, of, uh, of inhabitants of our, uh, of our country. Uh, so I, I would like to, to echo that as well. Thank you very much, Pavla. And you already mentioned a couple of, I mean, responded to de facto to some of the, the questions. I mean, there were questions about secondary movements. It's been interesting to hear your the position of, of your country in that respect. Um, there were questions indeed also about um, schooling uh, and also some of um, questions dealing with the potential fatigue uh, raising within communities, host communities, concerns about narrative shifting. I just wondered if you could, um, yeah, elaborate a little bit further on that, what kind of steps you're taking as a government. You were already referring to the fact that you're trying as much as plus possible to explain, to make sure that those investments when it comes to schools or alike benefit also the the larger population, but just interested to hear if there's any plans um, on how to some maybe address some of that. Yeah, of course, part of, uh, of the whole uh, strategic de debate we have in the Czech Republic is as well strategic communication and, uh, and of course, uh, the debate and the preparation of, uh, of uh, good communication towards, uh, towards the public. Uh, uh, we are now uh, in the middle of several um, scenarios for, uh, for communication strategies uh, in, in this area. I think it's a very important, uh, important part of, uh, of, of the whole debate. But uh, frankly, at the end, it's the local administration who needs uh, to deal with, uh, with all of this. It's, it's uh, really the trust of the local uh, administration that needs to be there, that there is a strategy, there is a plan uh, uh, in, in the government, uh, because at the end, it's them who need to explain to 
both uh, parts of the population. Uh, uh, so this is very important. We are trying to, to, to work on that as well. Uh, uh, so, so that we somehow have it all on all, all in one place. Uh, but uh, as I, I would like to say that it's not it's a fatigue, uh, but it doesn't mean that there is an anti a huge anti Ukrainian narrative. So that I'm not misunderstood. Uh, it's I not. I think that's that. an important point that you're making. Really good. Yeah. 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 So, so it's, it's more. Uh, it's 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 not not that. Uh, thank you. Um, it, I just wanted to signal to our uh, listeners that we would like to go maybe five minutes uh, extra into time just to, because there's so many questions and hopefully uh, Esther and Pavla <laughs> do not object to that. Esther, just maybe briefly also, there's a number of questions in the chat um, about uh, TPD. So on, on the one hand, um, we know, I mean, I remember last year that you were explaining to who is it, uh, who is eligible and who is not. Have you come across particular groups that you're particularly maybe you've seen that have not been covered by TPT that you're concerned about that to the future in thinking through how uh, a mechanism like TPD could be uh, reconfigured to also accompany that. And then there's also a number of questions about do you envisage that uh, what has happened with TPD and, and what has happened in terms of this kind of response to those who were fleeing Ukraine, that it has given a new impetus to discussions on the, the pact, uh, which we're still hoping to see some kind of, um, yeah, <laughs> result towards in the next year and year and a half. Uh, and, and lots of reference also to the Dublin regulation. And you mentioned, of course, the fact that um, with the TPD, member states agreed not to uh, apply the article that uh, would have otherwise resulted in maybe more complex distribution. So. Um, big questions, Esther. So on uh, on the scope, I would say that there are no specific groups in the TPD. So it's the council implementing decision that defines the scope. So if there are problems with the groups, it's because of the way it was defined in the scope of the country implementing decision and not so much as such the TPD, because the TPD simply says that this applies, it's an exceptional procedure that applies to people displaced uh, for several reasons that they cannot go back in safe and durable conditions to the countries of origin, or well, it doesn't even uh, say that exactly. But what I would say is that there were questions, obviously, about third country nationals, those that are not Ukrainians. Um, and actually what we have seen uh, through the, uh, the implementation, and I mentioned there's about 4 million uh, registrations in the temporary protection platform. Uh, what is, is more difficult to know about third country nationals, because what we have seen is that we have the vast majority of the member states have decided to apply uh, the temporary protection scheme uh, to third country nationals. So they have not opted for a double track system, a two track system between uh, I give uh, to third country nationals adequate protection and the others I give them temporary protection. No, the vast majority of the member states have opted for giving the same, the temporary protection. There are a few member states that decided to apply adequate protection, but what we have seen is that the way they have done it, obviously, is through the asylum. And if they are under asylum, they are not going to appear in the temporary protection platform, simply because they will be appearing on Eurodac because they are asylum seekers. But what we have seen is that um, for the member states that decided to apply set, um, adequate protection under national law, uh, some of them, what they have done is to apply the asylum uh, procedure, and uh, we have uh, good examples of some countries that actually that they did it was to apply a fast track. So to make sure that um, third country nationals, we have a similar access to rights, immediate access to rights, as was the case of um, of uh, Ukrainian nationals. So we saw that indeed the member states were trying to respect the spirit of, of the temporary protection, which is something quick that give access to rights. And those that did um, other systems, sometimes they were given humanitarian status under the national law. So I think we have seen also in the bilaterals we had with member states that there was a genuine effort to try to ensure that everybody who was fleeing the war from Ukraine was going to get protected in Europe, regardless. Uh, so that's what I would say. 
is what is difficult sometimes is to get statistics because I said they are, they are peer either under the Eurodac or because they don't have good system that happens, for example, for statelessness. It's difficult to know how many stateless people they have received temporary protection because their statistics are not there. So it leads again to one of the first challenges I mentioned, which is the difficulties we have with data. Now, uh, what about the new impetus in the pact? I would agree indeed that um, the fact that we have uh, the Ukrainian crisis and there has been such a, a solidarity expressed by all member states also created this um, camaraderie between member states, this companionship among member states. We are all in this together. And uh, if we can make it for this, we can make it anywhere. If I can make uh, this, this expression. So it did indeed created this trust that it was needed. The atmosphere was better. They, everybody was understanding each other better as well and where everybody was coming from. And I, my impression was that there was a, we cannot afford not to have the pact. Uh, there was this feeling is uh, the crisis are going to continue coming. We need to get this house in order also to avoid that others will exploit the fact that we don't have our house in order. So indeed, I think the Ukrainian crisis has created this spirit of, of understanding each other, listening to each other and willingness to compromise also because the huge solidarity effort. Dublin is a different story. I think we all have to comply with the legislation right now. We have to make Dublin work as well, because it's also one of the reasons why um, there is so much pressure and um, it's, it's, it's one of the elements that make the system and, and the trust among member states uh, defaulting, if I may say. So um, we will see what the future will take. Now there is a proposal on the table uh, with the commission, uh, the co-legislators is up to them to see um, how they uh, draw lessons from the current experience and decide what would be the best system. But I think everybody, as you said, Hani, what is important is to have all the tools, as many tools as possible that we allow us to react to as many crises as possible. So the ones that we know, are the ones that we might not know because we cannot even imagine. And if you asked two years ago somebody if we were going to activate Temporary Protection Directive, they would have laughed at your face and say, are you dreaming? So unfortunately, the world is such an unstable place that we have painfully understood that everything is unpredictable and we have to be ready for the unpredictable. A uh, very important point and also a really uh, important point in terms of the, the camaraderie. Uh, if I allowed, I just want to ask one more question, maybe briefly to Pavla, and then we'll, we'll have to close the, the, the webinar. Um, but yeah, just to bring it back to the Ukrainian uh, refugees as well, there's lots of questions, Pavla, in the, in the chat about labor market integration. As we said, that's of course, as long um, the longer that people stay, the more important this also becomes on the one hand for the Ukrainians themselves, but also for the host community to be able to mobilize the skills and the talent and expertise that they have within amidst their you know the the ukrainian population so are there any kind of steps that you're taking to facilitate that also in terms of skills recognition and the like but i also remember in our conversation in the past you were talking also about the ukrainian government sometimes asking you to be careful as to who to recruit and these kind of things so maybe if we can just end on that and then we'll close thank you yes uh uh, yeah, yeah, we have we are very lucky that because we have very low unemployment rate in the Czech Republic. So basically, whoever wants to work uh, is is working. Uh, uh, so we have a very high intake of uh, Ukrainians working uh, on on the uh, on the labor market. Uh, but as I said, uh, more low skill jobs uh, rather than high skilled. And what we are now trying is do the counseling and uh, at the labor market offices uh, for for the for the refugees themselves. Uh, but as I said, there is actually uh, a lack of uh, a small bill uh, on the Ukrainian side of the of the refugees that, that they are not so much uh, actually wishing to do that uh, because they're still uh, wishing to uh, to go back. That's that's just uh, what what we see at the at the labor uh, offices and as well from NGOs, we hear that. Uh, uh, so we will do, we have programs, but uh, of course you have to have both sides if, if they wish, wish to do that. There are certain parts and, and uh, it's a very sensitive issue, as you said, Hannah, uh, about uh, brain draining Ukraine. Uh, because uh, what we see from, uh, from the people who came uh, uh, that it's, uh, 
a rather middle class or upper middle class. Uh, so actually skilled or even high skilled people. Um, and uh, uh, of course, when we have talks with the with Ukrainian colleagues, for them, it's very important that uh, uh, not all the people uh, stay in Europe, because if they stay in Europe, they have a huge lack of, uh, of people in, uh, in Ukraine uh, in the future. Uh, and it's, it's a big problem, uh, and it might be a very big problem for Ukraine and for the reconstruction of U Ukraine. Uh, and, and specifically, they are, there are debates on the healthcare sector, uh, where the, there are very close debates with the, with the ministers in, in, in Kiev. Uh, uh, they are really wishing us not to uh, take the highly skilled uh, people uh, and uh, rather support their uh, return and reintegration once, once it's possible. So it's not that uh, one-sided uh, because for Europe and frankly speaking, it might be actually uh, added value uh, to have uh, such a large population of mainly skilled and highly skilled uh, people coming, uh, but uh, it would be a one way uh, only uh, thing uh, because for Ukraine, it's, it's very, very important that they keep the people and uh, that they can do, um, do the reconstruction once, once it's possible. Thank you very much, Pavla, and thank you very much, Esther. Really appreciate uh, your contributions and the, the lively discussion today. And also a big thanks, of course, to um, all the participants who sent in questions. And uh, yeah, it's been really interesting. We're, uh, sorry, we couldn't address all of your questions, but you made it sure that we addressed the most important ones and that you really enlivened the debate. So thank you very much for that. Uh, you can see here uh, where you can contact us and where uh, the audio and the video from today's webinar will be available uh, later today. And we do encourage you to have a look at our commentary that was published uh, earlier today. Uh, I would like to thank you all for joining us and for the conversation and especially big thanks to our two panelists. Goodbye.